next slide please <clears throat> so just anyone briefly tell me what is constipation what how would you define constipation someone just unmute and just say passage of art stool or not passing stool for uh, more than three days do you want to add something else to that uh yes dr savita what uh, next slide please it's uh, so, yeah please tell me it's incomplete Income. Yes. And does it have to be, uh, you know, not passing stools for so many days or can it be just, you know, every day, pa passing stools every day, but just incomplete uh, evacuation? Will that also be uh, included in constipation when the patient is or uh, symptomatic for it uh, that is true but uh, then you'll have need to know what their regular bowel regime was yeah that's, as in, you know that's uh, if they were passing every day or they were passing every other day or after two days or once in a week maybe so that that is normal for few people so uh, next slide please so as you correctly said persistent difficult infrequent or seemingly incomplete defecation is what is you know, the broad uh, definition of constipation. Next slide, please. <coughs> so uh, since we are de dealing with constipation, so we need to know a few colonic functions and what colon does. So can just, uh, can you guys just quickly, quickly uh, uh, point out what are the main functions, colon functions? Like what does it do mainly? What are the functions? What uh, uh, like what happens in colon? Anyone? Absorbs water, yes. Yes, very good. Anything else? So basically, as you rightly said, it absorbs a large amount of water is absorbed in the colon. Uh, then there is storage of the uh, ingested food. Then there is mix, mixing of the of food that is uh, taken in. And also main function would be peristalsis to pass on the, you know, bowel contents outside. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the basic uh, enteric nervous system. As you can see, there is the mucosa, the sub uh, uh, muscularis mucosa, submucosa. Uh, then you have the uh, submucosal plexus, then your circular muscles, and then the serosa and everything. So basically what happens is my, uh, uh, my enteric uh, plexus is the one which will uh, coordinate with your uh, peristalsis and everything everything so any damage to any of these structure can uh, possibly lead to constipation next slide please so as i said the if you consider uh, you know a daily oral intake of around two liters uh, with all your secretions and everything it uh, turns out to be approximately seven liters is added further to it uh, all the secretions included all over the uh, the gut. Then in small intestine, around seven liters is absorbed, and uh, and in colon, it's one point nine liters. Through defecation, I'm talking about around point one m one liter is uh, excreted out. Next slide. Oh, next slide, please. So what is the pathophysiology of uh, constipation or obstruction for that matter as well, but constipation in general. 
psychogenic uh, anism uh, you know there's a reflex disorder in in wherein you know instead of relaxation of the uh, sphincter there is contraction so uh, you you're not able to pass stools then because of any surgery or uh, trauma to the intestine there can be pa paralytic ileus which is an uh, acute uh, reflex of the gut uh, then there can be any uh, mechanical obstruction which can be luminal or uh, mural or extra luminal uh, then neurogenic uh, or myogenic, which is uh, basically either due to the fault in the myenteric uh, plexus or the musculature of the gut. So that can um, lead to constipation. F uh, many of the drugs causes constipation, which basically slows down the gut motility and thus causes uh, constipation. And if there is low, <clears throat> um, less bulk in the food that we take so less in fibers and more in carbs and uh, carbs then it kind of leads to constipation because uh, the bulk is not there which kind of stimulates the uh, peristaltic movements uh, next slide please yes immobility and uh, minimal movements will also cause uh, uh, constipation so as i said you know and the other few causes like the um, disease pathologies which could possibly lead to um, constipation are just kind of enumerated here. Uh, next slide, please. So non-pharmacological, uh, and if it's, you know that it is not because of few um, disease pathology or due to any medications, then we could try fiber diets or increasing the physical activity, increasing the fluid intake uh, for the patient and kind of uh, make your bowel habits a regular thing and kind of uh, schedule it in a way uh, so that it is easier for you to uh, kind of manage the bowel movements but these become uh, like so physical activity and increased fluid intake will not uh, matter so much but uh, rich fiber diet can have a, a contra effect I would say if uh, there is like less motility uh, and it's because of some underlying uh, like maybe you're giving opioids and that's why the patient is already constipated and you're giving him fiber rich diet it's not going to help much because the, the 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 reason it the uh, the reason for the constipation is because of the uh, opioid and blockage of the mu receptors in the gut wall that the motility is re uh, reduced so in despite giving rich fibers it's not going to help it pass down the stools so it can lead to further constipation and further bloating and further uh, discomfort for the patient so you need to kind of uh, manage both of them and then uh, give whichever uh, medicine would be uh, non-pharmacological methods which would be helpful for the patient next slide please Mm, pharmacological again so there are bulk formings laxatives surfactant uh, which are the softener stool softeners then osmotic agents which can, uh, get the fluid into the gut uh, into the gut so that there is a mm, kind of makes it less uh, less harder uh, then stimulant laxative, which basically stimulate the gut wall to start its peristaltic effect and then uh, pass the uh, in. And others like Pamora. Pamora are basically uh, peripheral uh, antagonists for mu receptors. So opioid receptors, uh, the mu peripheral mu receptors, so antagonists are there. So they basically he will help with opioid induced constipation uh, more uh, ra rather than the other ones. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I said, you know, bulk forming will bulk up the stools, <coughs> which will help them retain water and uh, improves the peristaltic uh, movements. Stools softener soften the stools. And these are basically the uh, kind of uh, uh, mechanism of actions of each of the um, laxatives that are used. Next slide, please. Uh, so, 
site of action of each of uh, is just briefly had given it so you can look at it uh, at a later time next slide please so uh, lubricants are uh, important in the way that it basically will help you prevent fissures and trauma to the anal canal as well so if the patient has been persistently constipated there is high chances that he has very hard stool in his rectum and uh, lower part of uh, the colon especially so even if you give laxative and it is you know that it is going to uh, help him you would still want to give a lubricant or maybe a glycerin suppository before giving the laxative or enema because it will help kind of soften the hardened stools and not prevent uh, further damage to the rectal wall also and the anal wall also uh, so you are glycerin suppository mineral oil enema or ductisec next slide please uh motility so motility agents will basically help you to increase the peristaltic movements and uh, usually medical medicine related movements are also uh, kind of uh, overcome with these so these are usually senna or bisacodyl and uh, enemas also because enema kind of uh, stretches out the gut wall which causes the initiation of the peristaltic movements uh, next slide please uh, so can you quickly tell me uh, whichever medicines you know which are constipating one one come on Yes, iron, morphine. Yes, anything else? Calcium channel blockers. Yes. Damn it, opioids. Opioids in general. Aluminium. Okay. Anything else? Anti-emetic. Any other? Yes. Uh, on yeah. Five three R. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. And okay. amitriptyline. Uh, yes, amitriptyline. And tricyclic, yeah, tricyclic anticholinergics will cause constipation. Next slide, please. <laughs> so, uh, next slide. Okay. So, basically, all uh, these are gen just generally have given all the uh, medicines which can potentially cause constipation, uh, but you can. I, they, it might be deficient and you might need to add a few more. Uh, next slide. So let's come to a case scenario. Uh, this patient is a 68 year old male with a gastric cancer. Uh, he was admitted for pain crisis and all the medicines are given below. So he is taking uh, diltiazem, docusid, gabapentin, ibuprofen, morphine, 60 uh, mg t, t thrice a day and codeine also 30 mg orally q3 rv uh, but that is sos and uh, melar miralax 7 so that is basically the your uh, um, laxative the uh, egg powder so anything uh, next slide so what is the potential cause for constipation What is is an uh, morphine and also in uh, with codeine that is the most constipating. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anything else in the drug history that is potentially constipating? Small checkup. Hmm? Oh, Delzem. Yes, Delzem will uh, will have some constipating. Uh, phys minimal physical activity, yes, that might be, but uh, uh, not every time. So since the patient is in a lot of pain, there's it's kind of difficult for him to move around. The seize itself, yes, they, if you know it's kind of uh, low oral intake only, then the amount of uh, bowel movement will also be less. Yes, reduce bowel movement. 
Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, six months down the line, he is uh, suspected with ileus, and he was previously uh, titrated for opioid medications and bovel regimen was also titrated. Uh, but the issue was persistent since the beginning of opioids. Next slide. Then what will you do? Currently, Dr. said Senna, polyethylene glycol also, bisacordial suppository also, and uh, everything, lactulose, milk of magnesia, everything has been tried, but not, uh, not no relief. Do you think this patient will help with the PAMORA, like a peripherally acting mu, uh, mu receptor and, uh, antagonist? That is methyl naltrexone, basically. So do you think this should be given to him? Or would you want to try something else before this? Enema manual evacuation. Okay. Anything else? Actually, we could try methyl naltrexone because like because of the opioids that he's having severe constipation which is not responding to either of the medications uh, this should help methyl naltrexone should help and it's uh, it's an oral tablet which uh, which will not have any effect on the uh, pain management because of uh, opioids so gut wall and not have any effect on its analgesia effect uh, morphine can be changed over to fentanyl. Yes, I, I do agree, but um, the concept that fentanyl is less constipating than uh, morphine is kind of not true because each oh, each opioid is constipating because of its mu uh, mu action of the mu receptor on the gut. The reason why fentanyl is a bit less constipating is because it kind of bypasses the gut. Um, mu receptors because it's subcutaneous so you does not actually have like a direct effect on the gut mu uh, receptors but uh, not necessarily that once you switch over to fentanyl that the constipation will be completely not so yeah. next slide please Another case scenario. So there is a continuous colicky abdominal pain in a 57 year old female with an stage four ovarian ca cancer. Uh, there is also abdominal distension and had no bowel movement since seven days. There is nausea and there is vomiting, and uh, there is large amount, large volume of which usually contains just the undigested food particles. And there is complete relief after she vomits. Do you think the patient is constipated or do you think there is some other reason for this? No oral intake. Uh, she's vomiting out once she eats. So... Uh, do you have any other... There's uh, like um, ovarian mass. Yes. Any other reason, potential reason that you would want to rule out? Yes, obstruction. You would want to rule out obstruction in this uh, patient. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So, coming to malignant bowel obstruction. No. Next slide, please. Yes. So basically, again, it is because of the uh, ineffective motility of the gut or there is direct occlusion of the uh, bobble, bobble. So um, that's why basically the stools are not able to pass on from a particular part of the gut. Uh, so common cancers are usually your abdominal and pelvic primaries and sometimes even metastasis from uh, the uh, lung cancer, uh, breast cancer or esophageal cancer can lead to um, uh, bowel obstruction. Next slide, please. 
so it can be either large bowel obstruction or a small bowel obstruction and that can be further divided into partial obstruction or your complete obstruction if uh, it is an operable uh, um, bowel obstruction that is to say that if the obstruction is only at one level and you have operated it with a colostomy done and everything the median survival would be around six months four to six months and if it's uh, inoperable then it comes down to four to six weeks next slide please so again coming back to the patient who we just discussed 57 57 year old lady with stage 4 ovarian cancer so uh, considering the history that you have do you think that the obstruction is in at the upper level or lower gi tract just from the history my upper gi upper gi why because undigested uh, food is the same the whatever patient will be taking that is yes ah uh, is taking it out yes correct and it's large volume so usually large the volume, GI, right uh, will have a uh, low volume uh, and uh, digested particles and fecal matter also sometimes come out next slide please uh can you come down till the flow chart gets done oh again i'm so sorry so it's kind of overlap no no come down from no 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 from uh so it's kind of overlapping but i'll kind of explain it to you so uh, in case of any uh bowel obstruction may it be like a partial one or a complete one what happens is that uh, there is increase in the luminal content of the gut in general because your let's just say that there's no vomiting there's nausea but there's no vomiting as of now so you're continuing to eat something or the other so the luminal content will increase so what will happen because of this is that your gut will kind of stretch out to the maximum that it can because of this your surface area of the uh, gut epithelia will increase which will lead to increased secretions of let's say water and your electrolytes and everything so because of this there is again bowel distension is there which will cause because bowel distension is one of the primary reasons for starting peristalsis this increase in bowel uh, this distension of the bowel will lead to your continuous colicky pain that you are having in the uh, in your uh, abdomen and also because of the stretch receptors just the continuous dull aching pain also will occur so you have both your bowel contractions also and your continuous pain also and because of the distension again your epithelia gets uh, damaged because of uh, because of its high tension high uh, pressure state which will lead to its inflammatory response which will lead to your uh, increased secretions of your prostaglandins and interleukins and everything which will further lead to uh, increased uh, edema of the gut wall uh, which will again lead to more secretions of uh, fluids and electrolytes <clears throat> this all leads to vomiting because your content is increasing and everything so kind of increase uh, causes vomiting so this is like a vicious cycle one leads to the other leading to other leading to the first thing again so it just goes on and on and on so next so this kind of forms the basis of how you will want to treat uh, the patient further down so just keep this in mind what all things are happening and why would you want to treat uh, the patient in certain way next slide okay so uh, as i said you know if it is like a uh, first time the patient is coming to you with obstruction and uh, potentially reversible if it's just once one level obstruction it's better uh, if it is partial it is better so 
reversible uh, obstruction will have a good prognosis surgically uh, operable manji, operable uh, obstruction will have a better prognosis partial will have a slightly better prognosis than a complete obstruction next slide please so in general what you need to do is you need to give uh, complete rest to the gut because it's already in a hyperdrive you would want to give some amount of rest to the gut so that is first thing that you give second thing is that you would want to reduce the uh, secretions that are occurring uh, you know getting uh, uh, getting into the lumen so you want to reduce the secretions third thing is that you want to uh, open up the bowel if possible uh, so that can be one by kind of reducing the edema of the gut wall and um, if possible to uh, reduce the reason why there is obstruction. So if possible that and third thing is that um, uh, and you want to kind of restart the motility of the gut as well. So um, NG tube is generally put in to remove the excess secretions that has already been accumulated in your stomach. So that will kind of help you reduce the uh, uh, distension of the bowel and in effect give rest to the bowel because it's no longer stretched out and no longer the high tension state that it was. Uh, then um, if surgically possible, then you, re you relieve the obstruction via surgery. Uh, if not possible, if it's multi -le multiple levels of obstruction, if it's not surgically possible or if it's the second time that it's reoccurring, so you will not want to go for re-surgery again. And you give supportive measures which include pharmacological and um, non-pharmacological measures. And depending on the prognosis, if you expect that this patient will benefit from further disease management and further treatments, then and the prognosis in years, then you would go for maximum level of supportive measures that you can give if it's in months you would uh, supplement the patient with parental nutrition maybe and hope that the medicine that you're planning to give will have an effect and he'll survive for uh, so many months and if you expect that the patient is morbid bound and poor prognosis maybe in weeks and all just give supportive measures and um, keep the patient as comfortable as possible so it kind of depends on how how and what the prognosis of the patient is. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I said, you know, the interventions that are possible are stenting, surgery, and decompressive measures. Decompressive measures usually are given to all the patients in the form of nasogastric tube. Venting gastrostomy is when you expect that the... Uh, um, that the obstruction will not be relieved, uh, but and the prognosis is, is not that great, but the patient wants to have something orally during the last few days of his or her life. So you kind of just, uh, you know, get the venting astrosomy done to take out the uh, food that has been ingested orally. So that he has that satisfaction that I've eaten and, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, whatever I have to do. Next slide, please. Mm, uh, just, just one more click. So uh, partial obstruction, uh, come down till the end of all the, yeah. So uh, what happens is that if it's partial obstruction, you can consider giving prokinetic to just kind of help the gut do its job and uh, relieve the constipation. But if it's complete obstruction, you would not want to give a prokinetic because uh, it can potentially lead to perforation as well. Uh, analgesics are given for the continuous pain and for the colic, uh, abdominal colic. Um, Anti-secretory to reduce the uh, uh, edema and the secretions that are occurring into the uh, gut wall, uh, gut lumen and antiemetics of course because the patient is nauseous and vomiting and anti-inflammatory in, mostly in the form of steroids to reduce the uh, gut wall edema as well and to reduce the inflammatory response that is occurring so this is in general what you would give for a bowel obstruction patient again varies from patient to patient you would not give all of them in all of them or you would not give just one in all of them 
so it is kind of individualized next slide please so basically if it's partial obstruction as i said you know you want to get the bobble to do its own work so you uh, start off with uh, uh, a prokaryotic maybe dexamethasone to reduce the wall edema and kind of uh, you know, increase the obstruction like the uh, at the level of obstruction if it's because of a mass then maybe reduce the edema around the mass so that the lumen is also kind of widens up and helps the stools then anti-secretory is not necessary because it's partial and most of the secretions would be passing through the obstructed area uh, laxatives can also be considered and opioids uh, can can be used or rather should be used sparingly depending on how much the pain is for the patient next slide please Uh, then for complete obstruction, it's completely opposite of what it is for partial. So you want to basically shut down the gut on your own. You don't want uh, it to have further uh, peristalsis because that will exacerbate the colicky pain uh, and everything. So you would want to uh, shut down the gut completely. So an NG tube in uh, C2 big to help uh, relieve the uh, relieve the distension of the bowel and dexamethasone to reduce the um, gut edema and the uh, edema around the primary obstructed level opioids for the continuous pain that is uh, occurring because of the bowel distension and uh, overall distension of the abdomen then anti-secretory uh, in this case will usually opiotide to reduce the secretions into the gut lumen um, Anti-emetics and anti nauseans like haloperidol is uh, should be considered. Next slide, please. And venting nausea. So coming to a case scenario, uh, in, it's a 42-year-old female with cervical cancer. She has peritoneal carcinomatosis and it is admitted for uh, small bowel obstruction. The medications that were started were uh, metoclopramide 10 mg IV Q6 hourly, dexamethasone 4 mg uh, twice a day, haloperidol 0.5 mg Q6 hourly with SOS dosing if required, and octiotride. Uh, do you think it is appropriate or do you want to add anything else to the medication chart? Uh, yes, as of now, we are discussing malignant bowel obstruction. So it's an association with cancer anything else you would like to add to this um, medicine chart or any uh, any other history that you would want It is partial, let's say it's partial obstruction. History of constipation. Uh, yes, she was, yes, she was constipated. Uh, let's say it's partial, she's already NBM. Uh, history of pain, yes, that mm -hmm. is very important because uh, you would want to know if, if there is colic present, then you would not give metoclopramide. And if it was, uh, if there was uh, additional continuous pain, then you would want to add an opioid to the regime as well. Um, in partial, octiotride would not be recommended, yes. Analgesics are recommended in partial and in complete obstruction. Next slide, please. So, as I said, you know, for continuous pain, you give opioids, despite the fact that opioids causes constipation, but here you want to give a rest to the gut. So, opioids are recommended even in partial uh, obstruction as well. And for your colicky pain, you have your anticholinergics like uh, glycopyrrolate or hyoscine and uh, anti-secretory like octiotride. Next slide, please. 
uh, so for nausea and vomiting, uh, metoclopramide is to be used only in partial obstruction because it will further exacerbate the um, uh, gut motility. And if the patient is having colic, then you would avoid that. Uh, octiotride will also help with the um, nausea and vomiting by reducing the secretions that are uh, coming into the gut lumen. So kind of helps prevent the uh, vowel distension. Hyocene um, and haloperidol will have a benefit for uh, MSs and scopolamine again by reducing the colic and the peristaltic movements will prevent nausea and vomiting. Next slide, please. So this is in general the uh, dosages of various medications that you would give for an obstructed patient and it varies from you'll have to kind of titrate it uh, according to the needs of the patient so it dip, uh, differs from patient to patient again there is a big um, a big query as how octiotide should be given because usually it is given q8 hourly in most of the uh, most of the uh, setups, but the half life is six hours. So they say that if you you're giving it every six uh, eight hourly, then after six hours the effect goes away and it comes down to whatever it was before you started the medicine. So a continuous infusion is preferred by some people, but some people still give it Q eight hour. You can even make it Q six hourly just to get over the um, the gap of two hours. Next slide, please. I think that's my last slide. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Rudina, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, so we don't have a case presentation today. So you have ambient time to ask questions to doctor. You can unmute from your end and speak or <laughs> put your questions in the chat. Uh, vomiting or Sorry? pain. How will octreotide help with? So basically, it helps reduce the uh, bowel distension, right? So the distension is the reason why there is colicky pain or the continuous pain that we have in obstructed patients. So once the distension is reduced, it automatically helps reducing the pain. So there's no separate mechanism as such. It just by itself reducing the secretions and reducing the distension, it helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, we 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 have to give an antiemetic in patients with uh, complete upper uh, GI obstruction because there'll be a lot of vomiting otherwise. So you need to give uh, antiemetic wherever the patient is having any nausea or vomiting. You have to give an antiemetic. Anti-secretory is not yes because you know it's partial so you expect even uh, you know actually even uh, the nausea and vomiting is not that severe in a partial obstruction uh, because you expect some amount of uh, uh, gut gut contents to pass through the partially obstructed level so anti-secretory is not recommended there. Uh, best laxative for opioid induced uh, constipation would be a methyl aldrexone because it will kind of completely uh, uh, act, uh, completely take out the effect of the opioids on the new receptors in the gut. So, Pamora would be very beneficial. It's not very, very freely available in India. So, that's one of the sad part. But a combination of a stimulant and a, um, um, a, st a stimulant will usually help with opioid induced constipation with the uh, uh, added to the surfactant agents. So in combination of those two would work equally, but uh, equally 
well. Uh, yeah, usually your high, high carbohydrate contained diet would generally cause a lot of constipation. So you kind of need to mix it with uh, proteins and fibers and etc. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I think there isn't any other questions. So if in 